Development is cloud. Right. So um, when I was developing this talk, I actually, I'm a software engineer. So basically all I do is I do application development. When I do documentation for my APIs, I am 100% doing internal documentation because I don't build them for external customers. I let them fill out through the usual kind of customer support channels. Um, when I when I build them right now, it's usually in the context of handover documentation. So I build the product, I build the POC, I build, I upgrade their systems, and then I hand it back over to the clients. So because there's been this common theme where the language that developers speak is different than the language the rest of the world speaks. <laughs> Um, this is really going to go over what that language is and what that means. Um, it's going to be a very fast and kind of loose survey over what cloud development looks like right now, especially in the context of building APIs. <clears throat> so one of the things we're going to talk about is cloud data um, services and how those are used to be build um, new APIs. Uh, we are also going to talk about migration options for legacy APIs. And we're going to talk about this concept called the Netflix API gateway model. Because the way, uh, way non-engineers explain it to me is wholly different than what it actually does. And as mentioned before, I build a lot of APIs for different people. Um, when I was working on Yahoo Fancy Sports, it's a high, we were building the backend APIs for the front end way back when, what came before jQuery? Um, whatever we used before jQuery was what we were using to power this front end because it was a very long time ago. Um, but we also had a very highly active, never went to sleep user race because it was fantasy sports and you can never let those guys sleep. And then when I went to NASA Ames, it was a much smaller user user base, which means that what, there wasn't a lot of interaction, but you had a lot of external limitations, such as it needed to be cheap because it's the government. It needed to be secure because you had everything had to be transparent to tax to um, taxpayers, basically. And now that I work over in the consulting firm, uh, I build it for enterprise clients, which is basically any client that is more than 500 people, I believe. I don't remember what the exact number is. So we all have a shared understanding right now of what, AP, of what APIs are, but for the purposes of this talk, it's going to be talking about that abstraction layer. Uh, that's a collection of managed endpoints provided by the cloud. And even though um, you can build them directly in the con console, you can also import um, Spartan definitions directly into a lot of the console providers and they will build them automatically. So, and you can also export your documentation that way also. It's not a great idea to let, let the computer do that sort of thing, but it, that option is there. So, the big four providers have really presented the same way of building APIs in the cloud. Uh, they all have a collection of services, one for provisioning endpoints, another for running um, what's called functions as a service, which is basically a very lightweight small container to run backend code, and a containerized service, which is like a bigger container, you see. Run back in code. Um, for I'm going to see if I can remember this without switching my notes. Um, AWS has API Gateway, Lambda for Functions, and um, Elastic Container Services. I should know that because that was the one I worked on all the time. Um, Google um, Google Cloud Provider has their best service is Apogee, even though they do have multiple services. Um, Google Cloud Functions and Kubernetes, they have really doubled down on Kubernetes. They are really invested a lot into it. Um, as for I, Azure, Azure has API management, Azure Functions, and Azure Container System, really straightforward. 
And IBM Cloud has API Connect. Um, they also have a thing called IBM Cloud Functions at OpenWisk. OpenWisk is really, really interesting where it lets you build any runtime into a function. It's actually pretty cool. And the container service, which I couldn't find the icon for, so I put a right, regular icon in there. I couldn't fail anything to find anything to fill out my cable. So there are many decisions when you're talking about pushing these um, APIs into the cloud, because there are many ways into it. Um, we're going to talk both about uh, legacy ones and new ones. Um, new ones, if, if you're ever going to build a new API, <coughs> you should use um, internal services to basically take advantage of other people's work. When a big provider like um, Amazon or Google or Microsoft or IBM, whenever they make an advancement, they put it into their services and you're the first ones to take advantage of it. Um, and also, it's up to them to keep their services clean, fast, and secure. You don't have to build anything and you it really pushes that high building just one step away from you so that if something goes down, it's not your fault and you're not the one to get sued. <laughs> So here is the here's one of the options you have for building a um, a net new API. It's a basically a containerized microservice, which is a very lightweight virtual machine, which can house the application code and any of its dependencies in a little container, <coughs> and it just uses whatever OS kernel, like all the hard stuff that is on the machine that's already built on. Now, for the APIs that are built on that, um, since everything's built inside the container, very little has to change, um, especially as far as your end user is concerned. Um, it only, nothing has moved. It's only on the, it's only on a different machine. The machine just looks a little weirder on the inside. So the, there are pros and cons to this, of course, just like there is for everything, and I will go through all of them. Um, best thing is you don't have to have skilled developers on building out new APIs. Everything that you had that worked before will work now. So you had document and document definitions that work there. It's the same ones that work out here because everything is the same. You can also move it from one cloud to another so long as the machines they have are pretty similar. You can, I say, say that, but that's not true. <laughs> You can't move anything because in touching, touching any code will cause everything to fall apart. Um, but it also gives you more runtime control because you're able to do stuff like that. And when I said that, I said the thing, and it was not true, is because if you do do it poorly, it will cause the entire cluster to go down. In which nothing matters anymore because the entire system is down and you have to rebuild it from scratch. That's not a good time. And because of that, overhead is hard. And you really, you have to trust um, developers who know, who generally don't like having to know how infrastructure works. They have to touch it now, and they, and they have to know how theirs works to make sure it doesn't ruin everything else. Now, this is what I do. Um, I build serverless payloads, uh, or code, sorry, uh, where it's a really fancy way of saying that you don't have to spin up a server. So the services use an API gateway. That is what exports all of your definitions. That is, some, that is what the end user sees. And it just shovels everything into the back end, whatever, whatever it's. Um, in this case, there are functions, which, like I said, little baby containers that you don't have to deal with because it's the cloud provider service managing everything. Um, the one that I put up here is something I designed solely for this presentation. <laughs> where it's a health monitor API, it just goes, checks various services, and puts, puts that in line. And when I said I do a lot of handover diagrams, which is more than, which is unfortunately more than endpoints and code, I have to show architecture diagrams like this, and if there was a way to do that automatically, that would be great, because this takes me an hour. So, more specifically on serverless APIs, um, the way they work is that the API gateway actually listens for requests, whether it be from 
an HTTP event request or um, or a schedule request or something like that. And then it just does all of the logic. I like this because it's lightweight and cheap. Um, so pay as you go service. As I said, you use cloud services, you get cloud optimization. So that's great. Except the problem is when you try to explain this to other people, it requires a lot of backstory and explaining stuff all the time. So you go, you know, they'll push their servers there, and which is a question I get all the time. But it doesn't matter because that's not the point. Um, so. You, there is some good education there, and because of this, when you do documentation, it cannot just be endpoints. And you also have to explain where every lambda is, where they all go to, what kind of logic it runs, because you can, since you can test them individually, you actually have to be able to document that stuff too. It's also, where all the requests are going, all the little services it's touching, and this makes observability in serverless a really big deal. Because that is where all more than like let's call it a new wave of auto automatically generated documentation is going and monitoring because it's very hard to connect all these SaaS products together. Also, because it's hard, it's really into the developer's responsibility, and developers don't like touching infrastructure. They don't. It's annoying, and I hate servers, and networking is hard. So you also one of the best things about cloud is the is the misplaced idea that you can move things between clouds without a problem. And this really accentuates that because since you're optimizing everything for one environment, you need to do a full migration plan if you ever plan to leave. But you're never going to bounce between clouds without doing that anyway. So it should be if, if you calculate it and consider it when you're doing your migration plans. Not really a big deal. So very rarely are we allowed to go someplace and build something new. If there's anything that's been up for more than, um, let's say, a couple months, then it's now legacy code. And you have to take care of it until it gets shut down. So there are ways to get even on-premises APIs into the cloud using those um, predefined definition and package code. You can do it that way, it'll make your life easier. Like I said, I work for the government. I didn't just work, I work for NASA, which is when they're not sending things into space, incredibly cheap. <laughs> they, they don't like paying for anything, which for good reason, it's hard to sell space to people. Um, so this is what we always ended up doing because it required the least amount of training, the least amount of initial, initial work, which is just making an exact same server in the cloud in the cloud environment, and then just putting all the code there, making sure all the routes were were the same, and just leaving it alone. And now it's technically in the cloud, even though it's doing the same thing. Um, the problem with that is that it's very expensive to keep a server up all the time. So you're paying for a 24-7 service, especially if you're doing internal internal web apps where everyone in the government goes home at 6 o'clock. So you also lose optimization because you have to apply like own patches and you have to do everything yourself. So even when it comes to patching when you're working for the government, that stuff has to get approved, that stuff has to get paid for. Now, this is the better plan is to modernize whatever legacy app you have. Uh, you take whatever is in your server, and you put it into a new server, and you do the exact same thing I just said, except now there's an additional step to the plan where you start spinning everything off, whether you're putting it into functions or microservices or other servers, I suppose. Um, this is better because it's future, because you're going to be developing on it. As, as the life cycle of the application goes on. And because you're starting to bring services in, you can optimize it by dropping off stuff that is old and stale and doesn't work anymore. And you end up eventually getting rid of, rid of that initial server that held everything in the first place. 
uh, over the course of time, you also take down the um, resources that serve particular certain needs. So it makes things a lot easier. It's problem is it's much slower, and when it's slow, it's expensive. It's because you have this tail of spinning things off, the, as far as the project is concerned, you just added two years to your project, and that is a very hard sell to convince a business leader to pay for something that already exists. And be, it's also a little language specific because cloud services don't always respect older languages. Um, AWS is pretty good with their selection, Azure, of course, primarily off of C Sharp and .NET, which is which can make things difficult. They do have Node and Python packages, but that's not what's off of it. And that brings me to Netflix. So Netflix is one of those issues where communication between business leaders and developers are two completely different things. So what happened was in 2014, they released something called the Edge Gateway, otherwise known as Zool, because everyone at Netflix thinks they're funny. <laughs> so, whatever they said in these town halls and in these partnership meetings was somehow translated so that when I discussed what a customer would need to either start a new API, API project um, or expand the one that they have, they say, I want an endpoint that can take any input and put out any, and reach any logic. And that is insane. It is straight up crazy. And when I ask very seriously, do you mean microservices? They're like, no, like that API that Netflix has. These are conversations I've had with multiple companies and it is very frustrating. So this is the journey I get to take. So what it actually is, is an edge, gateway, an edge gateway that allows multiple video clients, whatever you use to connect to Netflix, which is smart TV, um, smartphones, Roku, whatever, and connects to the Netflix user and streaming video services. And that uses a single API, API gateway that connects to a service layer, and that's what does its little Netflix magic and collects whatever data they need, whatever streams they need, whatever connections they need, and brings it back to the client. This works because all of the requests are the same. You're not going to log into Netflix on another machine and expect a completely different experience. All of that stuff is optimized on the front end for menus, but otherwise, it's still going to show you movies. What I hear is that they think because it can take in any client that it can take in any input. And that's just not what it does. What it does well is take a single workflow, which is watching movies, and does it in a way that the experience between machines is seamless, the experience between users is seamless, and the experience between Developers is seamless because everything's the same. And they did this by treating a very large project as a single product. And that product is watching videos on Zoom. <coughs> so when you're building, when you're specking out a very large API project, we still have to consider things with frequency, such as frequency and size because those are so important. Because they, because they imply purpose, right? It's like, we're not going to be pulling reports from the same thing that we're going to be watching YouTube on. How similar are those requests? Again, if we're watching YouTube and trying to pull reports, then they probably shouldn't be coming off of the same product. There are, other, there are, there are separate products that should be optimized to do the thing that they need to do well. Also, how many endpoints do you really need? Or resources, or whatever proxies that, that you require, because all cloud providers, because you're depending on them to infer your infrastructure, your, to rather control your infrastructure and optimize it, they also get this to assign limits. Amazon has, I believe it's a 300 resource limit, which doesn't include the final endpoint, it's also every tertiary um, resource between them. So if you're going to be shoving multiple business, 
instituted um, needs into one API, you're going to hit that limit very quickly. Also, they have a timeout of 30 seconds on a proxy. So unless, you're, unless you've tuned your request to be super fast, it's not going to work. And these are all things that you need to communicate to, like I said, developers and for users. Even end users need to know this because they need to know why they're just watching the little wheel on their Netflix and spin and spin and spin because I can't explain to my kid why is not loading fast enough. <laughs> you also have to make sure that there's a reason why you're doing this because you can't just make APIs for making them because I've also had customers try to do that. I want to get into a cloud and have a cloud API. Why? I don't know. All of your stuff is on prem and you won't move it. So it doesn't matter if, if your actual API is up in the cloud because it, you're losing a lot trying to make all of this work just so that you can say you get it. So if you can make one that is a single product in the cloud and optimize it for that, then that's probably better than trying to make one big generalized one. So, there are many ways in the cloud, the new one or legacy ones. Um, for new, I would go serverless, personally, because that's what I build every day and that's what makes me money. Um, also, it's faster and you run into less limitations that way. Uh, for, um, for legacy APIs, go with modernization. It's a long-term plan, but you get all the optimizations and I got them more, so it's obviously a good idea. Also, know what your API's limits are, not just whether or not it can do a load, but if that load's actually going to help you out. And if someone brings up Netflix's API, just remind them that it's one thing, not many things. It's very case specific. So unless you are Hulu and you're trying to steal their technology, which is open source, so it doesn't matter, then you probably don't need to build the thing the way that Netflix is building it. Also, if you try to read through the documentation, it's a lot. Like, it's a lot. And a lot of it is theory, and a lot of it is very difficult to parse through. So, it's a very hard story to tell, and it's a very hard thing to explain. So, as has been mentioned a couple times before today, they can do a lot, but they probably shouldn't. You should probably, you should be very specific on what your goals are, and how you can communicate that on both sides. 